Welcome to the distinguished lecture series of the Indian Mathematics Consortium. The aim here is to host virtual colloquia by some of the best researchers and expositors around the world. The speakers are carefully chosen by the scientific committee from among mathematicians who are not only distinguished researchers but are also known for the quality of their exposition. The principal aim here is to make the talks as widely accessible as possible, especially to PhD students. With this in view, the format of most of the talks will be in two stages. First, there will be a pre-recorded talk by the speaker, which will be posted online. Interested audience can then view this at their leisure and communicate questions, if any, to the organizers. The second stage will be a live interactive session between the speaker and interested participants, and that will be held about two weeks after posting the online talk. The approximate duration of the talk will be about 45 minutes, and that of the interactive session will be about half an hour. The Distinguished Lecture Series is co-hosted by IIT Bombay and ICTS Bangalore. Welcome. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Yves Benoit. So Yves Benoit presently holds a research position in Orsay, France, after holding a similar position at École Normale Supérieure. Yves Benoit's amazing work has been awarded by many awards, notably the Clay Research Award in 2011, the Grand Prix of the French Academy of Sciences in 2019, and he was also an invited speaker at ICM Seoul in 2014. He has held numerous visiting positions, for instance, in Berkeley, Brown, Yale, Tokyo, Cambridge, and TIFR Mumbai. Yves Benoit's main area of research is ergodic theory and discrete groups in the spirit of Furstenberg and Margulis. I cannot do justice in such a short time to his amazing mathematical achievements, but let me at least explain one motivation, Furstenberg times two times three conjecture. So let's identify the interval 0, 1 with R mod Z. Then multiplication by an integer, say 2 or 3, gives a self-mapping of the interval. In 67, Hillel Furstenberg proved that the only closed invariant subset, which are invariant by both time 2 and time 3 multiplications, are either finite or the full interval. So then, Furstenberg conjectured that the only ergodic invariant measures are atomic, with finite support, or Lebesgue. To this day, the answer to this question is unknown, but the research arising from this conjecture has been extremely active and fruitful. And one of Yves Benoit's celebrated results is, together with Jean-François Quint, the classification of stationary measures in some homogeneous setting. Yves Benoit is an astounding speaker, and I'm looking forward hearing him talk about Harish Chandra temporal representations and homogeneous spaces. Hi everybody. For this colloquium talk, I would like to speak on Arishandra temple representation and homogeneous spaces. I would also like to take this opportunity to advertise a collaboration with uh, Kobayashi from Tokyo University. He should be there. Oh, right here. Hi, Toshi. Ari Chandra is one of the greatest Indian mathematicians of the 20th century. He was born in Kampur in 1923, and he began by studying theoretical physics with Baba in Bangalore and with uh, Dirac in Cambridge. Very quickly, he understood the importance of representation theory for quantum physics and he decided to develop representation theory from a mathematical point of view. He revolutionized representation theory. He introduced 
completely new ideas, very efficient concept that nowadays everybody still uses in representation theory. Like for instance, the Arishandra modules, the Arishandra isomorphism, or the Arishandra tempered representation that I plan to discuss today. Oh, he is right there. Hi. I first want to explain the whole talk in three minutes so that you know where we are going to. I will not give precise definition. I will give them later in the talk. So we'll uh, discuss uh, connected semi-simple group G and uh, closed connected subgroup H so that the question G over H is the homogeneous space we want to study. And uh, by the Gothic letter G and H, um, we will mean uh, the early algebras. The main question uh, we want to focus is uh, about the unitary representation of G into the Hilbert space of uh, square integrable function in G over H, L2 G over H. And the question is whether this unitary representation is tempered or not. This is the main question of the talk. So for sure, to go on, I will have to define precisely what semi-simple mean, what a unitary representation is, what the space L2 G over H is exactly, and what tempered representation means. As I told you, I will explain that later. But right now, I want to explain what is the answer to the question. How can I characterize this purely analytic condition on the homogeneous space G over H? And what it will see is that uh, this condition is equivalent to a purely algebraic condition which is an inequality between two row functions. These row functions are functions on the Lie algebra H, and uh, one is the row function of H, and the other one is the row function of G over H. And the inequality of this row function is uh, this row criterion of tamperness. So we will prove that these two conditions, in fact, are equivalent. When both G and H are complex, the algebras, we can have a more geometric condition, which is uh, in the spirit of the orbit method. The orbit method involve the orbit, uh, the adjoint orbit in the Lie algebra. And this condition is that uh, the orthogonal of H for the killing form contains regular element. This is the orbit criterion. And uh, in this case, these uh, two conditions will be equivalent. These conditions are conditions which do not really depend on H because the, in the homogeneous space, H is well defined only up to conjugation. So these conditions depend on H only up to conjugation. And uh, also, we notice that uh, this uh, row condition is in fact, when you let H vary, a closed condition on H while this uh, orbit condition is an open condition on H. So 
To prove this last equivalence, we will not do it directly. In fact, we will introduce the limits of the conjugate of H. And we'll prove, in fact, not directly this equivalence, but uh, we will prove this equivalence through another condition, which is that among the limits of conjugate of H, there is at least one which is solvable. This is the SLA condition. And what we will prove is that, in fact, the row condition is equivalent to the SLA condition, and also that the SLA condition is equivalent to the orbit condition, the orb condition. And this is what uh, I plan to explain to you. Here is the precise organization of the talk. I will begin by giving the definition of a tempered representation and then of uh, the homogeneous space. Then I will describe in details the rho criterion, the orbit criterion, and the solvable limit algebra criterion. Then I want to give you some insight why these four conditions, which looks very different. The temperedness condition is an analytic condition, the row condition is an algebraic condition, the orbit condition is a geometric one, and the SLA condition is a topological one. So I will prove some equivalence so that you get a feeling why they might be related, and in fact they are equivalent. And I will end this talk by uh, two nice, challenging, open questions that do not seem out of reach. Let us begin with some definition. In this talk, G will be a connected, semi-simple, really group with finite center. Semi-simple just means that the Lie algebra is semi-simple. G has no solvable ideals. The main example is uh, the Lie group G SNR of n times n matrices with real coefficient and determinant 1. Then we will have a unitary representation of the Lie group G inside the unitary group of some Hilbert space. So unitary representation means that pi is a continuous morphism from G to the unitary group U of H of Hilbert space H. Unitary representation are the efficient way to do Fourier analysis on G. Indeed, remember, what is Fourier analysis on R? Fourier analysis is trying to decompose, and succeeding in fact, a function f of x, x a real variable, as a sum, or more precisely as an integral, of a character. So you have some coefficients that we denote by f hat of xi, which is the weight of the character e to the i x c, e to the i x x c in the function f. A way 
to uh, understand this uh, Fourier decomposition is a uh, the Fourier Plancherel formula, which says that uh, L2 of R the reinterpretation of the Fourier Plancherel formula you know is the Hilbert integral of some one-dimensional Hilbert space on which G act by the character Xi. So by analogy, to develop the same tool on uh, the Lie group G, what we want to do is to decompose the Hilbert space of square integrable function on G, L2 of G, as a direct integral of some Hilbert space H sigma D sigma for some irreducible uh, representation sigma of G. And then uh, everything you can do on R, you may try to do it on G. Now, among the unitary representation, Arishandra discovered that uh, some of them are better than the other. Those are the tempered representation. In fact, when they are irreducible, they are exactly those that you need to write this disintegration. So there are many equivalent definitions of temperedness. One is what I said, to be weakly contained in the regular representation. But another one is uh, the following one. Pi is tempered if for a dense set of vectors in the Hilbert space the coefficient function, this function is called the coefficient function, it's a function on G, its value at G is a Hermitian product of pi of G V with V itself and uh, the condition is that uh, this function is almost square integrable. This is the uh, following uh, bound, if you, the following integral on G of this coefficient. To the power 2 plus epsilon, this integral is finite. There are many other and very different uh, equivalent definitions of temperedness. I don't plan to explain them here to you. What I want to do is uh, to explain uh, three reasons why uh, these um, tempered representations are useful. The first reason is that uh, those representations are those which have the best decay for the coefficient function. And why is it useful? It's useful because if you apply unitary representation to a problem of counting in arithmetic, this coefficient controls the error term in the counting. So this way you get the best error term in arithmetic counting. The second reason that uh, tempered representation are so useful is that the irreducible tempered representation have in fact been classified, so they have been parametrized in the 80s uh, by uh, Knapp and Zuckerman. And uh, the third reason I want to explain why they are use useful is that uh, when you apply this definition to non irreducible representation pi, and when you disintegrate this representation in irreducible representation, like we have done here for the regular representation, you can detect the fact that pi is tempered. 
just by looking at the irreducible representations that occur. Pi is tampered if and only if these sigmas are almost surely tampered. So this is nice. Because once you know that your representation is tampered, you know that in its disintegration, the irreducible unitary representation that will occur are in knapp Zuckerman parametrization. Okay, so there are other reasons why uh, tampered representation are very useful, but uh, let's go on. A homogeneous space is a quotient of G by one of its closed subgroup, X is G over H. Here we will assume that the subgroup is connected, so we will not discuss the case, the important case, where H is a discrete group. On this quotient G over H, there is a, always a sum invariant measure, we denote it by DX. This is a measure such that when you push it by an element G of G, then uh, you get a multiple of the same measure with a factor which is a Jacobian, which is a function which depends on x. When this function is equal to 1, this means that this measure is g-invariant. Most of the case, there are uh, g-invariant uh, measures, in fact. And these cases are the case where h is unimodular. We will not assume h to be unimodular. So in any cases, uh, G acts uh, naturally on uh, the space of um, L2G over H of square integrable function, function which satisfies uh, that uh, the L2 norm is finite. The action, uh, since the measure is uh, not invariant, uh, is obtained by uh, translating uh, the variable x, but you add a suitable factor uh, so that uh, the action becomes unitary and you have the equality The pi of g preserves the L2 norm. This representation pi is uh, often called the induced representation of the trivial character of H to G. So the condition we want to study is the fact that this representation L to G over H is tampered. So we want to give this three criterion to detect that. And uh, let's begin by two examples. Not so easy example, in fact, uh, when H is compact, the representation in L2G over H is always tampered. And this fact is due to Arish Chandra. Another case is when H is amenable. Amenable means uh, that H is a compact extension of a solvable group. And in this case, also L2 G over H is tampered. Let's sketch very briefly uh, a proof of this fact. Uh, there is another equivalent definition of amenable, which says that uh, the trivial representation of H is weakly contained in the regular representation. of h, meaning that the coefficient of this representation, which is a trivial, the constant function, can be approximated by coefficient of this representation uniformly on compact set. And uh, then this kind of weak containment, here you have weak containment, such weak containment can be induced 
So when you induce this representation, you get uh, L2 G over H, which will be contained in the induced representation of L2 of H. This will be L2 of G. So here we have a unitary representation which is weakly contained in the regular. And I told you this is uh, one of the equivalent definition of a tampered representation. I now want to define the row functions that occur in the row criterion. So this function rho h and this function rho g over h. So for uh, v being either h or g over h, I will define rho v as a non-negative function on h by uh, rho v of x. x is an element in h. Is half the sum of the absolute value of the real part of the eigenvalue lambda of add x in v. Add x is nothing but the linear uh, map, which is just the bracket with x. <coughs> when v is h, rho h is just twice the usual rho function. But when v is equal to g over h, rho g over h is a new rho function. And our uh, tamperness criterion is just that uh, the representation L2 g over h is tampered if and only if this inequality is satisfied. Let's take an example to see that um, this criterion is very concrete and uh, you can check it with a little uh, linear algebra. So say for instance, the group G is SLP plus QR and the subgroup H is SLPR. So then the tamperness condition is that P is at most Q plus one. So this means that uh, for SL3 over SL2, the representation is tampered. But for SL4 over SL3, the representation is not tampered. So let me give you how you deduce this equivalence from the theorem. In this case, the Lie algebra H is nothing but uh, this uh, Lie algebra of block matrices, P times P blocks in a P plus Q times P plus Q matrices. And uh, if you choose X, to be uh, a diagonal matrix with coefficient uh, x1, xp, and 0, 0 in H. So you just have to check the rho criterion on these matrices. If you compute uh, rho h of x, you get this. This is the left hand side. Rho q of h is the right hand side. So this is the rho criterion. Let's call it star. And let's check that uh, this uh, star is equivalent to p is at most q plus 1. So if p is equal to q plus 1, so here you have p minus 1, and this inequality is easy to check. And for the converse, if star is true, uh, you apply star to a witness, and the witness will be x1, xp, p 
equal to minus 1, 0, 0, 1. And uh, you compute left hand side, right hand side, and you find 2 p minus 1, which is rho h of x, which has to be bounded by 2 times q. And this is our inequality that we wanted. So it's just a little bit of linear algebra to check the row condition. And it will tell you whether L2 g over h is tampered or not tampered. As we have just seen, the row criterion is a very efficient condition. For instance, it allows us to give the full list of non-tempered homogeneous spaces for which H is semi-simple. Now, we are looking for a more uh, geometric criterion of temperedness. It will be the orbit criterion. And this criterion is particularly simple when uh, both uh, the Lie group G and the subgroup H are complex Lie groups. For instance, uh, it's the case when G is the group SLP plus QC and H the subgroup SLPC. So from now on, we assume that both G and H are complex. To state this criterion, we need a few definitions. Very classical definition. First, the rank of G, which is the minimum dimension of uh, the centralizer of an element x of g. So this is the centralizer. And the set of regular elements is a set of elements for which uh, this dimension of the centralizer is as small as possible. We also need uh, the killing form, which is a symmetric, gene variant, uh, bilinear form, and non-degenerate one on the Lie algebra. It's given by the formula trace of add x, add y. It allows us to define uh, the orthogonal of h as the set of elements which are orthogonal to all the elements of H. And uh, the orbit criterion is just the fact that this orthogonal of H contains regular elements. And the second main theorem is that the rho criterion is equivalent to the orbit criterion when both G and H are complex. This equivalence looks a little bit surprising because the rho criterion is a closed condition on H, while the orbit criterion is an open condition of H. This means that if the rho condition is satisfied for all the elements of a sequence of Lie algebra, which converge, then the rho criterion will be satisfied for the limit Lie algebra. Open for the orbit criterion means that if this uh, condition orb is satisfied for one subalgebra H, it will be satisfied for all the subalgebra in the neighborhood. So it's surprising, but uh, it's just uh, like that. And it just means that both conditions, in fact, are open and closed. We have seen that the tempered condition is always satisfied for uh, H solvable. So it's a nice exercise to check, this is the last example, that uh, the orbit condition is satisfied when H is solvable. I will explain that in a few slides. We 
We will not prove directly the equivalence of the row condition and the orbit condition. We will go through an intermediate condition, which is the SLA condition. So the SLA conditions involve the orbit of uh, the Lie algebra for the adjoint action of G inside the set L of complex Lie subalgebras of G. So this set is included in the Grassmannian. of G. So it has a topology. So when I look at this orbit, which is a subset of L, I can consider its closure. And the SLA condition, the solvable limit algebra condition, tells you that in this closure there is a solvable Lie algebra. So the theorem 3, just add one step in theorem 2. It tells you that uh, the row and op condition are in fact equivalent to the SLA condition. Now, the previous example becomes the fact that the SLA condition is satisfied when H is solvable, which is very easy consequence of the definition. But the corollary that uh, this SLA condition is both an open and closed condition on H is a non-trivial one. And in fact, I don't know how to prove it directly. Indeed, the proof of this algebraic condition we have uh, uses um, unitary representation. I want to explain now why these four conditions are related by proving some of the implication. I will begin by proving that the temperedness condition implies the row condition. So we need to concentrate. This implication relies on the uniform decay of coefficient due to calling uh, a group and how. It says that there is a bound for every coefficient by the famous Arishandra function. up to some constant and uh, this constant is finite for instance when v is a k in the round vector so we will apply this bound to the case where v is a characteristic function of a small ball around the base point in g over h. This uniform bound is true for any g in g. We will apply it only when g is in the subgroup h and an element of the form exponential of an element x in the Lie algebra. So the proof is a sequence of four inequalities. Each of these inequalities is an idea. So what we want to do is to study this volume, the volume of the intersection of the ball with uh, the image of this ball by e to the x. So let me draw this ball. Here is my ball, b, and here is my base point, and then I apply e to the x, b.
This means some directions are expanded and some directions are contracted. And when you want to compute the volume of the intersection, which is there, what occurs are uh, the eigenvalue of the adjoint action of x and the sum of the eigenvalue which are negative. So this tells us that you have a lower bound for the volume of this intersection by the function e to the minus rho g over h of x. I'm assuming in this proof that h is unimodular. The second inequality is just the fact that uh, this volume is nothing uh, else than a coefficient. So this is just a definition of coefficient. Uh, the third is inequality is just the above bound that uh, the coefficients are bounded by a multiple of uh, the Arishandra function. The last inequality uh, is just a consequence of an asymptotic of the xi function near infinity, and in fact it is due to Arishandra. So we get that this is bounded by this for every x gives you the inequality that rho g is bounded by 2 rho g over h, which is just a reformulation of a rho criterion. We prove now that rho implies SLA. We begin by the case where h is a parabolic subalgebra q of g. Say for g is equal to SLN. This means that uh, h is of the form upper triangular matrices, block upper triangular matrices. that you can write as L plus U, L corresponding to the diagonal blocks and U corresponding to the upper blocks. The row condition, rho H bounded by rho G over H, involves the eigenvalue of H acting either on the all H or on the quotient G over H. So it tells us that there are more eigenvalues down than up. So this forces H to be uh, the Borel subalgebra B for which um, the block of size 1. So B is a maximal solvable subalgebra of G. So the SLA criterion is satisfied. Now we go to the general case. We notice that the row condition is closed. So we can replace H by any element uh, in the closure of the orbit. So in the closure of the orbit, you get smaller and smaller orbits. So choose an orbit of the smallest dimension. It will be a closed orbit. In fact, a compact one, because you are inside the Grassmannian. So such a compact orbit have a stabilizer, which is a parabolic subgroup. So this says that H is normalized by a parabolic subgroup. And then you apply case one. Now, Let's prove that SLA implies the orbit criterion. Um, 
Again, we begin by a special case, when H is solvable. So being solvable, it has to be included in a Borel subalgebra like here. But for the Borel subalgebra, it's easy to compute uh, the orthogonal. It's just uh, the set of matrices. Uh, it's included in the Borel, and uh, it's a set of upper triangular matrices with uh, zero on the diagonal. This orthogonal contains at least one regular element, which is this element. You have zero on the diagonal and one on the upper diagonal. And this element is regular. So this proves uh, our implication when H is solvable, but uh, in general, since the orbit condition is an open condition, you can always assume that H is solvable, and then you apply case one. I would like to end this talk by two open questions. The first question does not assume that G is a semi-simple Lie algebra. So it deals with a complex Lie algebra and it asks whether the SLA condition is still an open condition on H. So this is correct when G is semi-simple and one can check that this SLA condition is a closed condition. But we don't know whether it's an open condition. The second question deals with a real semi-simple Lie group G and uh, with a parabolic subgroup Q as we have seen in the previous slide of the form LU, L is the reductive part and U is the unipotent radical. You start with a unitary representation of this parabolic subgroup Q. And you assume that this unitary representation is tampered as a representation of L, of the reductive part. And you want to see that this is equivalent to the fact that the induced representation is tampered. This is a classical fact when the restriction of pi to u is a trivial representation. The general case uh, does not seem to be known and uh, one can check it at least when g is equal to SLN r, but it is open in general. Thank you for listening.